Thank you, Rose. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anton Maurer. My co-moderator, Alfred Sivi, and I are happy to share the next 50 minutes with you. We have two types of users, active participants, who can raise hands and uh, also contribute directly and passive participants who can use the chat. If you have any questions or if you want to make a remark, please give us a sign or hold up your hand. We will make just introductory remarks and also re reserve time for your contributions. Taming the unruly horse. Have you ever tried to find where this expression is coming from? It is about 200 years old. It was used by Judge Burrow in Richardson's v. Mellish in 1824 when he said of road public policy is a very unruly horse and when once you get astride, you never know where it will carry you. And about 80 years later, Lord Davy in Chanson v. Trefontaine Consolidates Gold Mines in 1902 said, public policy is always an unsafe and treacherous ground for legal decision. Public policy definitely has many aspects and we will just concentrate in our efforts on the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards and the public policy issue under the New York Convention. As you are for sure know, the recognition and enforcement of an arbitral award may also be refused in, if the competent authority in the country where recognition and enforcement is sought finds that the recognition and enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy of that country. It is said that this clause has to be interpreted enforcement friendly. But why? There are two reasons which justify this statement. It was a willful decision by the drafters to use may be refused and not shall be refused to give the a discretion to the judge. The drafters willfully did not approve shall to make more foreign awards enforceable. There is also a reason in the public drafting, in the drafting history, the working party number three, which was responsible for the Articles 3 to 5 of the New York Convention. These were 13 countries, including Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, USSR, and the UK, unanimously held that Article 5 to be the public policy exception clause should not be given a broad scope of application. So, taming the unruly horse. Lord Denning said it's possible. With a good man in the saddle, the unruly horse can be kept in control. It can jump over obstacles. Let me introduce that public policy of that country can lead to different results in still applying the New York Convention properly. There was a case recently which involved David Rifkin, famous arbitrator as chair of an ICC tribunal. David had not recognized that his law firm Debevoise was representing one of the parties in an unrelated case. He didn't report and he said, I didn't know and it didn't affect the award. The losing party tried to set aside the award and the US Second Circuit held not to set it aside because of the standard of section 10A, subsection two of the Federal Arbitration Act, which requires an evident partiality standard. 
Brazil, on the other side, did not recognize and enforce this award, or these two ICC awards. Brazil is insofar with respect to the public policy exception, not pro-enforcement and demands that it will not recognize if such and such situation applies. The Brazilian constitution says impartiality is a fundamental element of equality, due legal process and natural justice. Even if a potential conflict is unknown with the arbitrator, his independence and impartiality is objectively in doubt. Switzerland recognized these two ICC awards and enforced them because they have a different public policy standard. There's no violation of Swiss public policy and a, review, a refusal to enforce is justified only if there is a blatant breach of independence and impartiality. So you could see different countries have different standards and they are still in line with the public policy exception of the New York Convention. Now I give the microphone to Alfred. Thank you. So let me just put my slides up where I need them. There we go. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to be speaking uh, about the uh, public policy exception under US law uh, today. Uh, I'm going to start out by giving you a quite general introduction uh, uh, on the issue under US perspective, but then I, I thought what would be more interesting today uh, would be to introduce some cases where the public policy exception has become relevant in the recent years. So I'm going to take you through a few of the cases um, which have, have uh, stirred some debate in the United States um, and uh, we can then discuss them uh, in, the, in the discussion which is going to follow. Um, the Federal Arbitration Act um, in its section two incorporates the New York Convention. It's a very, very simple provision. It simply says that the New York Convention shall be enforced in the United States uh, by the United States courts. Uh, this provision came into force in 1970. And if we look at the case law uh, of the early 70s, then we can see um, how the, the uh, public policy approach of US courts that's still in force today uh, actually developed. Uh, the, the most famous case, of course, that we, we can't skip in this context is uh, Parsons uh, and Whitmore, in which the uh, Second Circuit Court made some, some very famous uh, statements with regard to public policy. And this is uh, the, the standard which has been applied consistently essentially since 1971. It says the convention's public policy defense should be construed narrowly. So this again is, uh, as already was said in the introduction, uh, is a reference to the, to the correct construction of the New York Convention. It says enforcement of foreign arbitral awards may be denied on this basis only where enforcement would violate the forum's most basic notions of morality and justice. Now this of course is less a clear statement of what public policy is on the United States law. It's more a definition per se of what public policy uh, could be uh, understood as in the United States. But if you read on in the judgment, it also says that the public policy uh, defense may not be read as a parochial device protective of national political interests because that would seriously undermine the convention's utility. And you could perhaps uh, read into that sentence that the US courts in this decision have introduced some sort of a, uh, a measure of 
what we refer to as, uh, as, as international public policy, which of course is a national standard of policy, but it means that the US courts will refrain from introducing national peculiarities into the notion of public policy and will uh, be tolerant um, when enforcing foreign arbitral awards. And I'm sure many of you will be aware that these are uh, sections that have been uh, repeatedly cited in the last 40 years uh, by US courts. But I thought now we'd go into, as I already indicated, some recent cases where this, this rather clear standard has perhaps not been applied perfectly. The first case that I wanted to take you is that uh, of Hardy exploration versus the government of India. And in that case, Hardy had concluded a contract uh, with the government of India for the exploitation uh, of national resources in India and India then uh, decided not to adhere to the contractual provisions. Hardy uh, started arbitration in Kuala Lumpur and obtained an award and this award was not an award for damages but for specific performance and India was ordered to let Hardy uh, continue the exploration and exploitation of national resources in India and enforcement of this award, also of other provisions, but specifically also of this part of the award, was sought in the United States. And the District Court of Columbia came to the conclusion that the award was contrary to public policy. And the policy of the United States that it determined was uh, that essentially of international comity. So what the court said was it's against US public policy for a United States court to enforce an award which orders another state to take specific action. Um, I could assume that if India had only been ordered to pay damages, the uh, result would have been a very different one. Um, and of course, an argument could be made, and this is something that we can discuss then, that uh, India, by concluding an arbitration agreement and by subjecting itself to the applicable law, which provides for specific performance, uh, would have waived uh, any right to uh, such committee. But the District Court of Columbia uh, thought otherwise. Another decision that I wanted to introduce today is that, and please excuse my uh, pronunciation, uh, that of Figue Rido Ferras Engenrada de Prejeto Limited versus Peru. Um, this is a decision of the Court of Appeal of the Second Circuit, and it has to do with a award rendered in Peru uh, against a um, Peruvian state held company, and the award which uh, which ordered payment of a certain amount by Peru was uh, was, was was presented to to the U.S. courts for enforcement. And uh, Peru argued uh, the doctrine of form, forum non convenience. And what the court said here was that there is a policy of Peru, and that policy was one uh, that had been uh, expressed in a Peruvian law that only provided for uh, a certain cap, a certain definite defined amount of money that Peru would pay uh, to satisfy foreign judgments. And for reasons which aren't entirely clear from the decision, based on this policy, uh, the US court uh, argued that forum non convenience would apply in the enforcement proceedings. So in the proceedings in which the US courts uh, basically transform an award into a US judgment for enforcement, that for those proceedings forum non convenience applied and therefore rejected uh, the enforcement application of this award. Um, of course, a lot of argument have been made that the forum non convenience uh, was applied incorrectly by the US courts, that uh, it, it does not apply if in, in an enforcement uh, stage of uh, proceedings, but only if a dispute itself is submitted to the US courts and so on. There's a long and very powerful dissenting opinion uh, by Lynch in the judgment that is well worth reading, but the, the, the perhaps uh, most most disputable uh, section of the of, of the judgment is the reasoning of the court why forum non convenience applies. If you look at Article Five of the New York Convention, you would see uh, 
presumably Article 52B of the public policy uh, exception, but that's not the, what the court refers to. It refers to Article 3, and Article 3 says uh, each contracting state should recognize arbitral awards as binding and enforce them in accordance with the rules of procedure of the territory where the award is relied upon. And based on that, the courts say uh, they can introduce forum non-convenience as a reason not to enforce a foreign arbitral award. Uh, I would uh, allege that that is a incorrect construction of Article 3 of the New York Convention and that you cannot add additional reasons for refusing recognition and enforcement of a foreign award, um, albeit if they are found in your procedural law via Article 3, the grounds are in Article 5 and in Article 5 only. The last decision, I'll be quite brief on this, uh, is the, uh, the case of Pemex. And Pemex is interesting because uh, in this case, uh, public policy wasn't used to uh, reject the enforcement of the award, but actually as a reason to enforce the award. Uh, there was a dispute between uh, Comisa, a Mexican company, and a Mexican state-held company, uh, which led to, an, uh, led, led to arbitration. Mexican government thought it was appropriate to support its state-held company by introducing some new legislative measures uh, regarding uh, government contracts regarding statute of limitations and regarding access to arbitration. Uh, the, uh, the tribunal uh, ignored these provisions and rendered an award in favor of Comisa. Um, and this award was then presented to US courts for recognition and enforcement. Uh, in the meantime, the Mexican court set the award aside, but the US courts essentially argued that there is a public policy or a policy in the United States um, and that is repugnant, repugnant to the fundamental notions of what is decent and just and um, that the setting aside of an award based on law that had an ex post application to an individual contract was a violation or was not acceptable uh, by US public policy and due to that public policy then, uh, the award that had actually been set aside was then enforced in the United States. And as a last comment, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop my presentation. Uh, that case is quite interesting if you uh, think also about the mechanism that's in Article 9 of the European Convention on International Commercial Arbitration, which is a rather underrated uh, convention. And that provides that an award that's been set aside in the host state for a violation of the host state's public policy, nevertheless shall be enforced in every other state. You cannot refuse recognition and enforcement of an award that's been set aside in the host state for a violation of that host state's public policy. So that mechanism strongly limits um, the, the, the reach of the public policy of the host state uh, beyond its borders. So with, with that uh, being said, I'll, I'll hand back uh, to Anton, who I think wanted to introduce some quite, um, some, some, some quite disputable decisions uh, under Russian law, please. Thank you, Alfred. In case you do not raise your hand for any questions, then we uh, try to entertain you. And uh, as you know, uh, at least as well as I may do, an award may uh, be found to be against the public policy of Russian law, basic principles of Russian law, when its effect is prohibited by law or harm sovereignty or security of state. And what I want to uh, talk about affects the interest of a large social group. This was, I think, uh, for the first time uh, formulated in a court decision of the Federal Arbitrage Court of Moscow in 2003. And this formulation was then uh, repeated by the Supreme Arbitrage Court in 2007 and the Federal Arbitrage Court of St. Petersburg in 2011. However, whether an award affects a large social group is not a legal issue, it's a political issue. And the issue is how can a judge handle that? And is this 
in conformity with the New York Convention. You may recall that uh, the Supreme Arbitrage Court issued two informational letters uh, on the interpretation of the New York Convention. That is the informational letter number 96 from 2005 and the informational letter 156 of 2013. The last informational letter tried to narrow the Russian public policy concept but it still includes the, if, whether there is an effect on the large scale social groups. Russia has, I think it's fair to say, an inconsistent application of the public policy exception. There are many judgments who enforce foreign arbitral awards, but they are also very surprising decisions. I may recall uh, you that there is a 2003 case of United World v. Krasny Yakor, where the Federal Arbitrage Court of the Volga Vyatsky region did not enforce an ICC award, which was worth less than US dollars 37,600. And the enforcement was denied because the Russian data alleged that it may have to file for an insolvency and that this may have a negative impact on the social and economic situation in Nizhny Novgorod. There were similar cases in, with the Federal Arbitrage Court in Irkutsk. However, that was later reversed by the Presidium of the Federal Arbitrage Court, and in 2009 by uh, the Federal Arbitrage Court in St. Petersburg. Russia sometimes says public policy is Russian public policy is violated if Russian law is misapplied. It's questionable whether this is in line with the New York Convention. Let me talk about two other surprising decisions. There is a 2017 Supreme Arbit Arbitrage Court decision where the basis of the dispute was a distribution agreement. There was a first award and such award was enforced in Russia. Then claimant, filed a second arbitration with different facts for a different time period. So the arbitral tribunal said the second arbitration is not precluded by the first award because the facts are different, still it's the same agreement. So this ICC award was uh, filed for enforcement in Russia. The first instance and the second instance would have enforced the award. However, they were, it was refused by the Supreme Arbitrage Court on the argument that it's a second award on the same agreement, but on different facts, but this would allegedly violate the Russian principle of legal certainty. So it was from a European perspective, it was not res judicata, but it was the enforcement was still refused on the alleged violation of the principle of legal certainty. Last but not least, we have a decision from the Supreme Arbitrage Court from 2018, where the arbitrage court held that the failure to comply with the requirement of pre-arbitration attempts for an amicable settlement makes the enforcement of the resulting award generally contrary to public Russian public policy. So if there is a 
clause which says before you file an foreign arbitration, you have to try to settle and you don't do, generally then an award is not enforceable in Russia. Do you have any questions up to now or shall we just continue to talk? If, if I do not, have, yes, we have one chat. Ah, uh, yes. I, I read it because I'm not sure if everybody can uh, see it. The entire idea of the relevance of the public policy concept to commercial arbitration is based on the assumption that commercial arbitration is quasi-judicial, contrary to a purely contractual nature of commercial arbitration. If you come up with any convincing substantiation of this assumption in court practice, Alfred, do you want to take a first shot? Otherwise, I do it. I think it's totally clear that an arbitral tribunal uses court functions. It is based on agreement, but also on the appropriate arbitration law, which permits that disputes are resolved by arbitral tribunal. So I think it is a quasi-judicial decision, and therefore it has the effect of a judgment in the country where it is uh, rendered, and therefore it can be enforced as a foreign arbitral award, uh, similar to the structures as a foreign court decision may be enforced abroad. Yes, I think I think that's that that that's that's absolutely clear. I think this this concept of the truly international arbitration that was promulgated in the eighties uh, is essentially dead. The arbitration was rooted in the national law because it is that national law that turns a piece of paper or a few pieces of paper into an award that is actually enforceable and actually has legal existence. Um, and so I, I think I think that's from a conceptual point of view that's that, that I think cannot be uh, seriously disputed. Um, the relevance of of, pub of the public policy concept, um, whether that is based on that notion, um, I'm, I'm I'm not entirely sure how the two the two concepts interconnect. I mean, obviously, if you're going to uh, if you're going to uh, give a private party that is perhaps not part of the court structure of a specific state, the possibility uh, to, to, to render a legally binding decision that, that is more than a piece of paper, then you want some measure of control over it. And the public policy then, of course, is the, the basically the last net that you have uh, to, to, to uh, dispose of uh, awards that are so, so completely uh, repugnant to your legal system that you do not want your your legal system to provide them with any any measure of of legal enforceability. Quite interesting in that in in, in that context. I believe that Belgium, sometime in the eighties, had a short um, a short uh, introduction of the possibility to exclude all uh, challenges to awards. I, I believe also based on public policy, as long as no Belgian party was involved. Um, so you could opt out of the possibility of setting an award aside also for the violation of public policy. But uh, interestingly, nobody wanted that. The, the users uh, um, did, did not make any use of the possibility to opt out of this because they obviously, the parties as well as the states, want the possibility to set the award aside. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that actually answers the question, but I hope it does. Um, I don't see, we have a, we have a raised yeah. hand. Wait a minute. But who is it? Yes. Talking permitted, excellent. Ali Khan, you, you, you have to unmute. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Do you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Oh, lovely. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure that uh, I can uh, um, join the conversation, but apparently it worked out. So uh, the, 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 uh, the question actually, uh, which you have just discussed, uh, was raised by myself, and I can elaborate on this uh, further. Uh, I'm asking this because I'm uh, uh, both uh, practically and uh, maybe even more academically interested in this subject. Um, the question, uh, the question uh, actually um, arises from the 
contractual um, contractual theory of international commercial arbitration and its nature. And uh, according to the contractual theory, which I think is quite, uh, I think, um, convincing, at least to me, is that uh, the tribunal is essentially uh, constituting the party's will. So it's not actually resolving uh, the dispute in a common understanding, uh, as if uh, a dispute would be resolved by a court, a state court. Rather, uh, the two parties are appointing tribunal and then uh, uh, possibly the two co-arbitrators are uh, appointing or selecting uh, the chairman. But in any case, uh, all the members of the tribunal are meant to constitute uh, the party's will with respect to a disputable issue. And if that is the case, and if we assume that that theory uh, is correct, then uh, uh, essentially tribunal is not applying the law in a public law sense. And therefore uh, that explains why uh, the tribunal and its decision does not have to render a lawful uh, judgment or award. Uh, rather, uh, the tribunal has to interpret uh, whatever rules they agree to apply, uh, which does not have to be consistent even with the court practice, because it does not affect the court practice, it does not affect the public law environment. And in that respect, we cannot consider arbitration, particularly commercial arbitration, to be a quasi-judicial institution, because if it was a quasi-judicial institution, it would have to comply with the standards of judicial uh, dispute resolution. And if we agree on that, and if we agree that the tribunal is not applying the law in the like classical uh, understanding of uh, the application of the law, rather it only interprets the rules, uh, and it is not applying the law, then it's only constituting the party's will. As th the same could have been done uh, by the parties themselves. And they don't have to do it in accordance with the law. They don't have to, when they interpret the rules uh, in order to like resolve a dispute between them, they don't have to do it in accordance with the law. They, de they have to do it in the manner in which they understand the law if you're following that. And if so, if it's exclusively a constitution of parties will, then the public law, the public policy may potentially be irrelevant in principle. I understand this is like quite an unusual approach, but that would be consistent with the uh, contractual uh, theory of the nature of international arbitration and generally commercial arbitration. Uh, so I, what I'm interested in uh, is uh, in court practice that essentially elaborates and substantiates the nature of commercial arbitration. Because my feeling, and I think uh, to a certain extent you are like confirming uh, that this is my uh, that my impression is correct. My impression is that nobody really gets into the question of the nature of arbitration, arbitral tribunal, and commercial arbitration. We just jump into, we assume that this is quasi-judicial institution and therefore public policy is applicable, is relevant. Is it, is it uh, what you gather from court practice as well? Sorry for the long comment. To give you a shorter answer, I think no. When I sit as an arbitrator, I try to apply the law which governs the dispute, as a judge would do. We hear witnesses, we look at documents, and we decide. And therefore, our judgment is enforceable if it is not set aside. It has the quality of a judgment. If it would be just a private 
completely composed decision making on whatever rule, such a thing would most likely not be enforceable if it is not governed by the relevant arbitration law at the seat where the arbitral uh, or where this body will decide a dispute. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you mean when you say the arbitrator is not supposed to apply the law but interpret the rules of the parties. Um, uh, Rally Khan, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, 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 what the approach would be um, to, to disregard the law and basically just look at the contract and give an, an, an interpretation of the contract which would not be based on the applicable law? Is, is, is that the theory that you would be promulgating? Yes, uh, essentially, if, uh, I mean, if, if we assume, if we suppose that the tribunal is obliged to apply the law correctly, and then there is a convincing evidence that the law was not applied correctly. Yes. Would that mean that on that basis, the award has to be assigned, set aside? Apparently not. No, at least, uh, at least, at, at least in the in the systems that I'm familiar with, the the mere misapplication of the law would not suffice to to a violation of public policy. Exceptions may apply in the areas of competition laws or or, or, or what else. But generally, if you just misapply contract law, you've misapplied contract law. But you still you're still supposed to apply the law as arbitrator. And there are countries where the misapplication of law or the misinterpretation of a contract is sometimes held to violate the public policy of the country. This is especially true sometimes in India. And uh, perhaps we can uh, discuss a little bit about that uh, because India is perhaps the most serious violating country of the New York Convention of all the countries which uh, misapply the New York Convention. Because India even has several definitions of what is public policy and this depends upon which old law will be applicable. Because when India introduces new laws it stipulates usually that the law is active only prospectively. That means for all arbitral disputes which were filed earlier or sometimes when the agreement was entered into earlier, the old law would apply and uh, therefore they have broad variety of public policy uh, definitions. India also had and still has for some uh, cases that public policy is violated if the award is patently illegal. That means it does, did not apply the law properly. So you see that there is that there are cases where the misapplication of law or the misinterpretation of, an, of a contract was held to be violating public policy of India. We even have also uh, such things in China. China is uh, more arbitration friendly than India. But still, the judge, if uh, the public policy of China is relevant, does not have any discretion as required by the New York Convention. Uh, as you may know, uh, China has introduced when uh, the public policy exception application and handling did go out of hand, and reporting up the instances. So if the first instance does not want to enforce an award, it has to send the case internally to the Court of Appeals. 
And if the Court of Appeals thinks the same as the Court of First Instance, it has to send the case to the Supreme People's Court uh, to the Fourth Division, which finally will make a decision either to enforce or not to enforce. And I'm always surprised how often the, the Supreme People's Court still have to rule on uh, applications to enforce an award uh, and overturn and overrule the lower court's decision because uh, it seems to be totally clear what the Supreme Court thinks is the law. But I don't know uh, if the lower courts think the Supreme Court, Supreme People's Court to change the law or if the lower courts are under such political pressure that they just send the decision to the Supreme People's Court so they are not uh, the one to be blamed if a foreign arbitral award is to be enforced. Are there, are there any more questions or comments from, from the audience? Because we understood that this, this is supposed to be a forum in which we're going to be debating and not, uh, not, not, not just giving a presentation. Is there anybody who would like to raise any point with regard to what has been said in the presentations or follow up on what Valikan has said? If not, then I raise another question. Can you report on any cases you saw in your practice where the public policy exception was either properly applied or not properly applied? Well, if nobody's going to raise their hand, then I'll, 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 I'll speak briefly about, about the, the, the Austrian approach to this, where it's public policy is sometimes invoked, but uh, only in very, very rare circumstances is successfully invoked. Um, and there's, there's, there's essentially two, two, two bodies of law where you can, uh, where, where you can successfully try to, um, well, there's one body of law where you can successfully try to raise it. That's, uh, that's essentially all aspects of European law because the, the Austrian Supreme Court back in, in, the, in the late 90s after Austria had just exceeded the Union uh, was, was quite devout, so to say. And as soon as any aspect of European law uh, was brought before the Supreme Court that had been dealt with by the tribunal, uh, the Supreme Court um, has, has basically um, gone to a, a, a revision of four because it believes that every aspect of European law uh, is a matter of public policy. So if you submit a, an award for scrutiny or for enforcement that takes, in particular, takes, takes rules of European competition law uh, into account, then that's basically the only area where you're going to be successful in perhaps uh, interesting the judges in the, in the result of the award. And they go into quite some detail uh, on, on, on whether the law was applied correctly in that, but only because they consider competition law to be per se public policy. You won't, you won't, uh, you, you won't manage that on, on any other, um, on the application of any other legal rules. So contract law, the like, would, would never have the same effect. And that actually, that, 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 that went so far, that, that deference to European law, that the Supreme Court actually set an award aside, I believe in 1997, uh, in which the arbitrators accordingly had misapplied the uh, Austrian implementation of the sixth directive on value added tax. That very, very relevant, well, actually it's not irrelevant, but that perhaps not so prominent uh, directive was considered by the Austrian Supreme Court also to be part of uh, Austrian public policy. So the application of value added tax, the correct ap application of the rules and value added tax, uh, because they came from the European Union were also considered to be public policy. But I think now 25 years on, uh, you, you wouldn't be so lucky to convince the Supreme Court of the public policy quality of, of rules like that again. Uh, other than that, I think it's essentially, well, it's not impossible, very difficult to move, to move a court uh, in, in Austria, at least, to, to, to apply the public policy exception. 
And the same is true for Germany, is true for Switzerland. Um, it's definitely true for Singapore and for Korea because uh, many countries even do not apply uh, just the public policy, but even demand a violation of international public policy where the standard is even higher than in a regular uh, national public policy. So if, if still no on the other hand. Is there? I think that's still yes. Right. Malika, yes yeah it's still me again to support you <laughs> in your conversation but to answer your question uh, regarding uh, interesting uh, public policy related uh, cases uh, in Kazakhstan court practice uh, there was uh, a recent case where quite recent case uh, where uh, an arbitral award was set aside it was an international um, commercial arbitration case uh, um, in which a award was uh, set aside on public policy grounds due to uh, the misapplication of limitation period. Uh, the court considered uh, that uh, it concerns public policy, but uh, luckily um, the, the judgment uh, which set aside the award was abolished by the Supreme Court mm -hmm. under a very strong public influence, uh, I think. Uh, but generally, there is a tendency. It used to be much worse uh, because the law previously, um, before the introduction of uh, the currently uh, enact uh, arbitration law, uh, considered uh, misapplication of material law to a certain extent uh, a form of uh, violation of public policy because there was a requirement for domestic awards to be lawful as they used the term in the law. They said that the law said that uh, the domestic awards had to uh, be lawful and that was interpreted as a correct interpretation of the law, which also, I mean, a sign of underdevelopment of uh, the legislation and court practice uh, concerning international commercial arbitration and commercial arbitration in general. So that was quite curious, I think. Was this an award rendered in Kazakhstan or abroad? It was an award rendered in Kazakhstan. The seat was in Kazakhstan. And that's why the court found itself competent to consider uh, the question of setting aside the award. Yes, there are some countries where uh, the courts take a more proactive approach in setting aside uh, awards uh, issued in their country if the home law is applicable uh, Kazakhstan may be one, uh, India may be another one, uh, there may be other ones too who uh, say if uh, an arbitral tribunal is seated in our home territory and has to apply the home law, uh, we take a more proactive approach if it is incorrect. Uh, but there are also countries uh, like India, for example, who may set aside a foreign award if it has to apply Indian law. But that is a true exception. We've, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've been asked by the organizers uh, two minutes ago to wrap up because we only have three minutes left since that was two, two and a half minutes ago. I, I, I think it's, it's probably time now. Yes. Um, to, to thank everybody for their uh, attention, to, to thank Varikan for his participation uh, in, in, in the discussion. Um, unless there are any very, very pressing questions, I would suggest that we, that we leave it at that. Thank you very much. It thank was you. a pleasure uh, to entertain you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Alfred, thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much.